In our last video, we talked about the microcytic anemias, and in this video, we're going to continue our tour through the anemias, but this time, we're going to talk about macrocytic anemias. We started the last video by talking about this flowchart with production on the left, removal on the right, and peripheral circulation in the middle. And just to review, we discussed how in the microcytic anemias, which I'll abbreviate here, we had no change in the removal in RBCs, but a change in the production, and this equaled a drop in our total RBC population. In the macrocytic anemias, as we'll see shortly, we have the same kind of setup. No change in the removal, but a change in the production, which leads to a drop in RBCs, hence we get the name anemia. In the previous video, in the microcytic anemias, this was because of bad production of hemoglobin. However, in the macrocytic anemias, we have a slightly different mechanism, which we'll get to in just a bit. Like we talked about with the microcytic anemias, the macro part of the macrocytic name gives away what's wrong with these red blood cells, which you could see here on this peripheral blood smear. The cells here look huge, and you can see that they're kind of oblong and oval, and you don't see that nice donut shape. If this red blood cell to the top right here were on the high end of normal, you kind of see a little bit of a donut, but here you don't really see that middle. And these cells, just to review, have a really big volume, and the definition of macrocytosis is cells that have more than 100 femtoliters. So we'll say greater than 100 femtoliters of volume. So what actually causes a macrocytic anemia? Well, to kind of clump all the macrocytic anemias together, the main mechanism here is deficiencies in DNA production. So, like we did for the microcytic anemias, we'll just abbreviate this by saying bad DNA. So if you remember back to your cell bio courses when you learned about the cell cycle, each cell has a cycle, and it proceeds through four phases. We'll start up top with M, or mitotic, where the cell divides. It then progresses into G1, where the cell grows. If it grows big enough and decides to divide, it'll go through the S phase, or the synthesis phase, where it copies its DNA over in order to prepare for a division. And then before it splits in the M phase, it goes through G2, where the cell grows and grows. And along the way, there are a couple of checkpoints that the cell has to pass through in order to complete the cell cycle. There's one over here, before S, and there's one over here, in between G2 and M. For the macrocytic anemias, we're going to be focusing on this one right here the checkpoint in between G2 and M. Now at this checkpoint, the cell is making sure that it's ready to divide. And in order to do so, it has to make sure that it has correctly copied DNA in order to proceed from G2 to M. Now if the DNA hasn't been copied correctly, the cell is going to keep growing and growing in its G2 phase until all of its DNA has been copied and the cell is ready to proceed from G2 into M. In the macrocytic anemias, this is exactly what happens. Since all of the DNA hasn't been copied correctly, the cell is just going to keep growing and growing until all of that DNA is copied and the cell can finally divide. What that results in is really big cells, since the cells keep growing until they're ready to divide. The problem here is that these cells, once they keep growing, they're going to break down and be hemolyzed, because it's not normal for a cell to keep growing and growing beyond its normal parameters. And when this happens in the bone marrow, it gets a special name. It's called intermedullary hemolysis. So since we have a change in RBC production, and we're losing some of these RBCs to intermedullary hemolysis, what we end up with is a drop in our total RBC population. In order to compensate for this, we get erythroid hyperplasia in the bone marrow to try and churn out more RBCs, but since these RBCs have the same problem, they can't pass from G2 to M normally, we get increased numbers of immature cells in the bone marrow. And because these cells are so large, we give it a special name. This is called a megaloblastic anemia, and it looks just like this. So this word, megaloblastic, what does it mean exactly? Well, let's break it down by parts, and then start by looking at the name itself. So it's megaloblastic, and that refers to this picture here. So the first half of this word, megalo, just means really big. So the fact that these precursor cells are very large, like I'll outline here in white. And blastic refers to the fact that these cells are immature. This is why other types of cells you may have heard of before, like erythroblast or trophoblast, refer to cells that are immature, that haven't yet reached maturity, in which case they get the suffix site. So megaloblastic just means big, immature cells. Now, so far in megaloblastic anemia, we've been talking as if it only referred to red blood cells. But since the mechanism is bad production of DNA, it affects all cells equally, including the other white blood cells. In this picture, you can see what's known as a hypersegmented poly. 
So I'll just label this picture hyper segmented poly. And polys, or polymorphonuclear leukocytes, or PMNs, otherwise known as neutrophils, like we know, normally have a multi-lobe nucleus. But this one has at least uh, six or seven lobes, which is more than it normally should. And this indicates a problem in DNA synthesis. And if the pathologist sees just one of these hypersegmented polys in peripheral circulation, that's enough to clinch the diagnosis of a macrocytic anemia. So now that we've got our mechanism down, let's talk about how you can develop a macrocytic anemia. And really, there's two main causes. The first is a deficiency of folate. So I'll just write decreased folate. And the second one is a deficiency in vitamin B12. So I'll just write decreased B12. Now, folate is otherwise known as vitamin B9, and for our purposes today, we can refer to it as THF, or tetrahydrofolate, the form in which it's found in the body. So why does a folate or a B12 deficiency lead to macrocytic anemia? And the answer is that both of these are necessary for proper DNA production, specifically of the purines. So let's talk about how. Now, vitamin B12 is involved in really only two reactions, and the one that's important to us today is the conversion of homocysteine into methionine. Now, vitamin B12, which I'll just draw here in blue, is a cofactor, and another participant in this reaction is tetrahydrofolate, which is changed from its N5 form into its regular THF form. So this step, the conversion of homocysteine to methionine, requires both B12 and THF. Now, THF, which is formed from this step, goes on through a number of subsequent reactions to form the purines, which is necessary for DNA because this is both adenine and guanine. So you can see that without THF, or without B12 to allow THF to be present, the purines can't be made. And without enough purines, the DNA can't be synthesized correctly, which would lead to the problems described above, ending up in a macrocytic anemia. So how are folate and B12 absorbed? Well, let's look at this model of the digestive system to figure it out. And here I've drawn what we can consider the stomach, and we'll consider the rest of this the small bowel, and we'll say this is the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, and we won't draw the large bowel beyond that. So folate, which I'll take care of here in green, is absorbed in the proximal GI. So let's say this region. And I'll draw this as green triangles, and it's taken in in the diet, and it's actually in green leafy vegetables, which is where the word foliage comes from. So folate, which comes in as folic acid, is absorbed somewhere in the beginning of the GI. So vitamin B12, which I'll underline here in light green and represent as these light green squares, it also comes in with the diet, but it's not absorbed until way down here in the terminal ileum. So let's label this B12. And it has a special way of being absorbed. It turns out that there's these special cells in the stomach called parietal cells, which release something called intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factor, which I'll represent with these pink circles being released from these parietal cells, binds to B12 and travels with them all the way down the gut until they get to the terminal ileum. And it's only once they're there, and only if they're attached to intrinsic factor, are they allowed to be absorbed. So I'll just label this pink as intrinsic factor. So how could you actually get a folate or a B12 deficiency? Well, let's go ahead and look at a decrease in folate first. And really the main way you get a decrease in folate is malnutrition, by not including enough green leafy vegetables in your diet. So for the most part, these are people who are undernourished. It could be children or more classically, alcoholics. We don't have much stores of folate in our body, so this onsets in a few weeks if there hasn't been enough folate in the diet. Fortunately, there's a really good treatment for this, and that's the addition of oral folic acid therapy. So I'll say oral folic acid. And this will replace the folate in your body really quickly. And in fact, the bone marrow reverts to normal in about 24 hours, and your peripheral blood returns to normal in about one week. A B12 deficiency, on the other hand, is a little bit different. We have a large amount of B12 stores in our body, so it takes a lot longer to onset. And because B12 is absorbed with intrinsic factor, we have one extra step through which we can get a problem. So anything that interrupts B12 absorption is going to affect the amount of B12 in our bodies. So this can be from things like resection, 
It could be surgical removal of the terminal ilium or the stomach when indicated. It could be because of a tapeworm, which is preventing our bodies from uptaking B12. Or more classically, it's from a lack of intrinsic factor. So we'll say decrease intrinsic factor. And there's a specific disease in which your body attacks these parietal cells, which prevents intrinsic factor from being released. And if you don't have intrinsic factor, you can't absorb the B12. And this gets a special name. It's called pernicious anemia. Now, because we have lots of B12 in our body, you usually see pernicious anemia in older individuals because it takes a long time to develop. Fortunately, there's a really good treatment here, and that's the addition of B12 into the diet. But unlike folate, it's done parenterally. So whereas in folate you would give oral folic acid pills, here you give parenteral B12. And just like folate, this reverses B12 deficiency really quickly. Your bone marrow reverts to normal in about a day, and your blood returns to normal in about a week. One other piece of information to know about B12 is that you could have a peripheral neuropathy. The other use of B12 in the body, other than forming methionine from homocysteine, is to break down fatty acids. And in doing so, it's thought that it could alter the lipid composition of the membranes and neurons, which could potentially lead to this peripheral neuropathy. And classically, it's of the dorsal columns, which means these patients would lose their vibration sense along with their proprioception. The final thing to mention here is that this can sometimes be caused by medication. The main way of forming THF in the body is directly from folic acid. And this is catalyzed by an enzyme which gets the name DHFR, or dihydrofolate reductase. And it turns out that we have a lot of drugs that attack this step in the biochemical pathway. And one of the most well-known is methotrexate, which is used as chemotherapy for certain type of cancers. And the thought process behind this is because it blocks the production of THF, it'll block the DNA synthesis, and thus the growth of cells that are fast-growing, which usually includes the cancers. Some other drugs that might do this include AZT for treatment of HIV, Bactrim, and Cyclophosphamide. So we've covered the macrocytic anemias, the microcytic anemias, and the hemolytic anemias. And in the last video in the series, we'll put it all together to figure out how to work up a patient to figure out what kind of anemia they have.